Hi guys, and welcome back to this week's episode of Let's Chat Ethics. I'm your co-host, Oriana. And I'm your other co-host, Amanda. And this week, we're back from our Easter break, uh, and we're back with two super special guests. So we've got Ryan Hart and Alba Curry. And uh, full disclosure, Alba Curry and I are related. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Alba is a PhD student in comparative literature, and she's looking at anger in um, ancient... China and ancient Greece. Yes, <laughs> <Got that very. laughs> um, And we have also got Ryan Hart, and Ryan holds a PhD in the comparative thought and literature of China and Greece as well, and he specialized in ethics. He has also lived and taught in East Asia and in the US, and next autumn, or this autumn in 2021, he'll start um, a post as an assistant professor of Asian and comparative philosophy at Utah Valley University. Um, so we're, Thank you for having us. Super excited that you're here, guys. Um, yeah. And so just to give you all a little introduction as to what we're talking about today, we're obviously talking about ancient Greece and their AI principles. No. <laughs> we're, we're talking about... <laughs> Alba looks so worried. <laughs> She's like, wait, what am I here to do? <laughs> Didn't prepare for this. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm like, there's the one passage, right, Ryan, the one passage with the robots. Oh, Let's wait, go okay. find it. <laughs> We want to talk yeah. about this as well, but uh, actually today we're going to talk about China. Um, so obviously <laughs> Chinese AI, <laughs> AI ethics principles, Chinese AI, they've been in the news recently a lot. Um, and Oriana and I have briefly talked about um, sort of the Chinese take on, on AI in a couple of episodes in the past. So I think we probably talked about it a little bit during some of the episodes on the European guidelines. We certainly talked about there being uh, the Chinese guidelines, so they're the Beijing AI principles. And um, every time we talk about them, Alva tells me that we have a very one-sided Western-centric view. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and we really need to, to look at it a little bit more. So uh, that's why you guys are here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I, I agree with Alba, I think in this case that we do, obviously, as two Western <clears throat> Western women, Western European women, we do have a, obviously a very centric, Western centric view of, of the problem. Um, and so we're very, very excited that, that you guys are here. We're going to get to to talk a little bit more about um, Chinese philosophy. Chinese values, the Chinese take on, on AI ethics. Um, I think probably privacy is the, the one that tends to stick out to people the most of the one thing that the Chinese government absolutely does not um, respect in terms of, of AI. And certainly that um, probably a lot of Chinese tech doesn't respect uh, compared to um, in Europe where we have GDPR that's obviously very privacy centric, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I kind of want to open the floor to uh, maybe Alva, you look very ready to to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still recovering about having to talk about ancient Greece and artificial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that would make a fantastic... Uh, that would make uh, a great episode. Study. So look, look forward to that, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, there is one passage, right? And maybe we can talk about it at the end if you want. Yes. Uh, although it doesn't really deal with ethics. There's just an example of robots. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I first want to say I love your podcast, right? And I always kind yeah. of wish I was there with you and I have to stop myself from not bombarding your Twitter account. And the one time <laughs> I didn't, the one time I didn't manage to stop myself, I ended up just DMing Oriana by accident. <laughs> yeah. But I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Um, it was great, great contributions. <laughs> thank you. But uh, but yeah, so I mean, I of course, like uh, Amanda said, right, I've uh, mentioned to both of you, but to other people that when people criticize China, they do it. Right, from a very uh, Western-centric point of view, but also from, from a point of sort of ignorance. 
and and of not sort of really trying to really it comes from in my opinion and other people's opinion it comes from the thought that china has nothing to contribute to ethics and that's part of where people think that uh, the sort of disregard for Chinese history and, and et cetera comes from. So I, I was going to say, I have a, a book here that's uh, great called Beyond Liberal Democracy uh, by Daniel Bell. And he talks precisely about this issue, right? That you have a lot of people go to China and try to teach China about democratic values, but they go there without having bothered to read uh, or talk about anything to do with Chinese history. And that's kind of where I see Ryan and I being able to make a, a valuable contribution today. Um, so before I ask what Ryan thinks, I just wanted to say, so both of us do comparative uh, philosophy, comparative literature. And, and I think it's, it's a lot more valuable than people think it is, right? Because our first job is, um, and I heard it put really well recently, right, is to be kind of transgressive. So that means, right, let's say we, we hear in the media, uh, China's this sort of big bad wolf, right? So what compar good comparativists will do is be like a sort of devil's advocate as an exercise, right? And try really hard to debunk that, right? And, and only if you've really sort of exhausted all your resources and you can't debunk it, then, then you'll entertain it, right? So that's how I see it. But um, let's see maybe a little bit what Ryan thinks that uh, the contribution, you know, that academia might have to this conversation. Academia has such a crummy contribution to everything. Um, but comparatism, I think, is super useful, right? So, um, like all of a sudden, there are, you know, even when people do deal with China, which they sort of have to nowadays because you can't avoid it, um, there's this really long history of dealing with China only through Western categories. And it's old. It goes back to, if you read like Enlightenment era European thinkers, like, Immanuel Kant or Hegel, people like that, talk about China and they talk about Chinese philosophy and they say, um, you know, Hegel says something like, ah, Confucius is, an, is a nice guy, but that's not real philosophy. It's not moral thought. It's just, well, you know, fortune cookie aphorism, that sort of thing. So this has been going on for centuries. Um, and so people do talk about China, but usually very badly. Um, and I think the interest, one interesting thing about comparison is that, um, you know, if you're being honest, you're not going to get outside of your own boundaries and frameworks and prejudices. Like we're all uh, Westerners in one way or another, right? And we're not going to be able to take off our identities and our histories and all our cultural blinders to have an objective conversation. There's in a way no such thing. But comparatists hopefully can at least make us aware that we are projecting those categories, that you know, you're not talking objectively, you're talking through a particular lens and it makes sense to be aware of that lens and it makes sense to try and figure out how that lens has shaped not only your answers, but the questions you're asking. Um, and so ideally comparison is helpful to do that uh, because at least you'll end up with a conclusion or a policy recommendation or whatever it is that's more subtle or more robust or more connected to actual things that on the ground people historically do in those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, well, no, yeah. So I was, I was just gonna. Uh, you just, uh, Ryan, reminded me of uh, one of the I ironies of all of this. So, right. So, if you look at uh, how the media has covered China and China with regards to artificial intelligence, right? It's Point of, from the point of view, like Amanda and Oriana pointing out, like of, of privacy, right, of lack of freedom, of violating human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that Ryan, Ryan has pointed out to me before is that actually um, when you ask Chinese people, right, whether they value, you know, privacy, you know, under these definitions, right, a grand majority of them just don't think it's as important as some of the other things that, that they're getting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the irony is that we as Westerners are saying, bad China, you're not democratic, but actually the Chinese government seems to be listening to what it is that the people's sort of priorities are. And we're the ones that are kind of saying, oh no, Chinese people, these, these ought not to be, you know, your concerns, you should be worried about privacy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. And, 
I kind of I kind of jumped ahead, but but Ryan kind of reminded me of 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 that issue as well. Yeah, that's yeah. A very interesting. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was on a on a panel about uh, conversational AI in the actually it was to do with um, in the medical medical sphere. So you know. Uh, imagine some kind of medical Alexa, maybe an expert system, it could be that's conversational, right? And on the, the panel we had, so there was me and then there was another sort of computer scientist, a sociologist, a lawyer and a doctor. And we all, like all the sort of sciencey people, we were all like privacy, privacy, privacy. We cannot possibly give all the NHS data to Google because privacy is so important. And mm -hmm. Very interestingly, the doctor, so German doctor, <laughs> um, he was very adamant that why not? I mean, if handing over, like, why is privacy more important than, than human life? At what point did we actually make this decision? Um, so mm -hmm. it's it's right. interesting that even within, I guess, in, in the West, uh, we have some people who do think there are things that are more important than privacy and that maybe privacy is not uh, the all and end all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like, um, and I think we spoke about this in maybe like, I can't remember, we've done so many episodes now. It's definitely, actually, no, it was probably the privacy episode. I don't know why. I said. <laughs> it was probably the 30 guidelines privacy episode where we spoke about, um, yeah, the importance of privacy seen in um, Europe. However, I think I, I remember mentioning that the UK had like, there's some of the most CCTV systems in the world. But the UK is very quick to point the finger at China and say it doesn't regard privacy as like an ultimate, you know, like as a freedom or um, as a human right. But yet the UK has kind of been like labeled as a big brother society for a while now. Like a, a town near where my parents live has, I think, the most CCTV cameras in the whole of the UK. So it's like <laughs> everywhere. So it, it's just interesting. Like you were saying, Alba, we're quite quick to kind of point the finger at China um, when is it that different in the UK just it's like it's kind of repackaged in a different framework yeah yeah no absolutely yeah. actually and I mean think about the US mm -hmm. like the, I mean the US spies on everybody the US spies on other world leaders mm -hmm. has there been a publicly confirmed international news story about the Chinese government illegally surveilling the phones of the leaders of European countries right. no as far as I know but that has happened with the US and Mm -hmm. nothing has stopped it like it's still ongoing mm -hmm. the u.s does this more than anyone and has almost total cooperation and gets away with it because partly they are the biggest angriest kid on the playground but also partly because <laughs> they package it in the right branding right that it's about mm -hmm. democracy or it's about fighting terror it's about whatever and so they just get away with it mm -hmm. yeah well, so I have two things to say about this. One is just a small comment on what Oriana was saying about the CCTV camera. So when I was an undergrad, so this is 2012, uh, there was a student that made an art project that was literally uh, him compiling all the footage from where he could track absolutely every step from his art school to his home, right? There was no blank spots, right? So, you know, like, absolutely, right? Like, like, how is that different from the CCTV system in China, right? And we, we can get to that later. But then I, I um, so in thinking about this topic, and this is now related to what Ryan was saying, that maybe part of our job, right, in trying to talk about uh, ethical principles in AI is really, we're going to have to try and di divorce, like, international relations speech from actual ethical concerns, because unfortunately from like, I've read so much media coverage about this of many different sources, right? Leanings uh, in documentary form and whatever form, but it's really all still written in my opinion from this international relations point of view, hmm. right? Where it's more about the interests of each country against each country, right? And so then it really sounds like the criticisms that they're making about China are still kind of imbued in this kind of Cold War speech, right? And, and about like, they're gonna take over and that's why we're worried about this new five-year plan that they have. Uh, and, and that's not helpful for what we're doing, I think. 
right? And yeah. and I and I was trying to think, you know, why do we let like Ryan was saying, like all these governments get away with this kind of hypocrisy, right? But it's just part of the. It seems to me it's just part of the international relations game where you need kind of leverage against other countries in order to get the things that you need, right? But that should not be what what's our interest, right? Yeah. Uh, and yet it just seems quite hard to separate. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a thought. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting point because I think, I don't know, for anybody who reads the um, the guidelines, the principles from Beijing, they actually sound quite similar to the, the European ones, in fact. Like the, the format is written quite differently, but you know, they they still emphasize the the need to to do good and to make AI that is beneficial to society, that is environmentally sustainable. Um, they still ask for you know to be res responsible and uh, explainability, transparency, robustness. Uh, mm -hmm. They still ask for the, the you know to, to sort out the, the problem with uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and bias. Um, so they they ring. Quite similarly, I mean, if, if you read them, they they sound and so we'll actually we'll link them in the, the description information of the box for anybody who wants to check them out. Um, and I, I do suggest that um, people actually read them. Um, so it's it's very interesting that given that we have these very similar guidelines, we don't have like the the speech around AI in China. It's so kind of doomsday like right like it's mm -hmm. yeah it's it's very interesting um so um, mm -hmm. yeah um i think i'm gonna give the floor back to al i think uh, yeah. it would be really cool if you could you know we've got both of you here that do the comparative literature and comparative philosophy and so we're very lucky that that you decided to join us and maybe you can <laughs> um yeah situate us a little bit more yeah. yeah, give us like the historical like context. Yeah, well, here I think I'm just going to pass it to Ryan, but I'll say a couple of things, right? Because um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the issues are like, again, like this is try and put like uh, international relations to the side if we, if we can, right? But um, the issue with, as I see it, that people have with um, China's AI principles, right? Because they they have decided, right, it's part of their plan that they're going to be the world leaders of ethical principles uh, mm -hmm. for AI, right? So you're like, and like Amanda's pointing out, like, and they sound good. In fact, they very much start with this is human-centered. Yeah, that's their first, mm -hmm. the very first one is doing good. And, yeah. you know, that's not even something that's actually explicitly said in the European guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, exactly. And that's why some some people have pointed out that they're, in fact, more generous in the ethical sense than any European one. But here's I think here's what makes the West uncomfortable. Right. Which is that um, in the Chinese political system, they don't have a division right of the judicial system uh, from the political system so that the, the people that will decide ultimately how to interpret um, these guidelines, right, is the government. And that's, that's where the West has issues, right? But, uh, and now it's when I'm gonna, Ryan's gonna be much better explaining all of this, right? Like um, China has a history, right, of, of Confucianism, which is uh, sort of, you know, and I don't mean this as a bad thing, a kind of paternalistic government, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes the West uncomfortable, but it's not necessarily bad. Yeah. Right? Um, so, uh, you know, Ryan, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's good. Um, yeah, one thing I would just say as a response to that before talking about like sort of historical context stuff is just, I think you're right that that non-separation between judiciary and government in China does make people nervous. But again, I would just point out, speaking of the the American here, like it's the same problem in America. It's not as if I was going to say, yeah. objective, distinct mm -hmm. bastions of rationality that everybody thinks they are. Like they're not. Judges are appointed by politicians, and so mm -hmm. politicians only appoint specific judges for specific reasons. 
Um, yeah. It's just as intermeshed here, but again, it's a matter of sort of branding or rhetoric or how do we talk about the court? We talk about mm -hmm. judges and justice through this sort of enlightenment legacy where a judge is this rational, reasonable actor who's going to pursue the truth independent of whatever conniving politicians want. And that's just stupidly unrealistic. That's never how it has worked. Um, so yeah, um, historic, so okay, that's a huge question. But um, yeah, I guess one thing to think about, like Alba said, right, is that the sort of Chinese models of government, and I would say models plural on purpose, because mm -hmm. um, it hasn't always operated the same, you know, like 3,000-ish years of almost continuous history that's been documented, right, um, in the same language. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's more than almost any other culture on the planet, I think. Um, but, you know, they had this from the very, very beginning, um, when the first dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, overthrew the Shang dynasty around oh, 1700 BC. Um, part of the way they justified that was with this thing called the mandate of heaven. Um, and it was this idea that heaven, or the same word means sky, Qian in Mandarin, um, this kind of not anthropomorphic God sitting on a cloud idea, but more of like a, um, the cosmic order of things, right? The heaven has given the new dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, a mandate because the old dynasty did such a bad job that they lost heaven's permission or heaven's mandate to rule. And so this concept comes up again throughout like 3000 years of Chinese history where when one dynasty starts to crumble, there's famine, there's plague, there's unrest, there's revolt, whatever it is. Part of the justification that's used to replace them is that they've lost the mandate of heaven. Uh, and it's, it's both different from a lot of Western things, but also very similar. So I think it's different in the sense that um, we in a lot of you know, Western European um, North American countries, we like to ground the legitimacy of government on um, say the mandate of the people. That's what we like to say, right? So the United States is a government by the people, for the people, that sort of thing. Politicians are elected with the support of the people. They have the mandate. They talk about that all the time in US politics. Um, so we still have this idea of mandates um, and that the government is only there because they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's different in the sense that the mandate of heaven in China was, as far as I know, never articulated as a, a mandate from the actual people who were ruled. It wasn't the people giving their consent so much. Um, whereas the, the myth, at least, is that in Western countries, that is what's happening. We are only ruled by the governments we have because we have consented to it. And this, the mythical part is that we could stop consenting at any moment and the government would reform and go away, which is absurd, right? Um, so that's one big thing that's been, that's been going on in China, right? There's this idea that, you know, how is the government doing? Is it doing the things it's supposed to do? And if it is, in a way that traditionally speaking, that's proof that the government has this mandate of heaven. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that nowadays all the billions of people in China believe that their government has the mandate of heaven or anything. But this, this rhetoric or this cultural attitude that's been around for millennia is, well, is the government behaving well? Is it working? Is it doing the things it's supposed to do? Do we have mass famines? Do we have mass starvation? And if we don't, then let it go. And so this goes back to all this point that, you know, when you talk to Chinese people or when they're polled or surveyed um, consistently, they find that they're generally okay with the government having a bunch of their data. They're generally okay with the government surveilling things because they think, well, I have a job. I have food, I can, you know, my parents can read when their parents couldn't read, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And so what's the problem? Like, yeah, they're reading my emails, but reading my emails, you know, privacy is this intangible abstract idea. I can actually eat. That's, that's not abstract. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I, I, I could say a lot more about like Chinese history and philosophy and context and stuff, we probably will. But just for starters, I would say that's a, a big contextual thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just gonna say, right, like something that uh, the Chinese government uh, has mentioned over and over, uh, like in the Security Council, et cetera, right, is that, you know, there's sort of ethical principles from the West, like don't solve human rights crises, right? Like when you, there's, there's, no food or no shelter or 
access to uh you know medical things right like what good are they and then of course the flip side of that which i'm i don't know why i'm advertising this book but i liked it <laughs> <laughs> we will link it in the description box <laughs> right uh he he breaks down a bit of the the issues he's focusing on human rights right the discourse of human rights in china right and, and of course right he he sort of plays devil's advocate uh, against himself right and one of the problems is that sometimes governments that are not adhering to uh the universal declaration of human rights right will say well right now it's just not a priority because what i need to do is x y and z and then i will you know mm -hmm. make it a priority and and i mean we can all see the issues you know that can come <clears throat> up with that uh right so so that's um that's you know that's maybe uh how to go against a teeny bit about like what you know what the west could answer to what ryan said yeah, right I mean, about the the food etc cetera, etc cetera, right but, yeah thinking mm -hmm. back at to that that panel i was talking about i think one of the uh, i think it was the other computer scientist basically uh, his response to the the doctor was that as a society we have already decided that uh, some things are more important than human life and so maybe it doesn't matter if you've got famine as long as you've got privacy um, <laughs> which when you contextualize it and really think about it it's like but you know I, mean, I don't know maybe you wouldn't think that if you were starving <laughs> I was going like, to say that's a very privileged I think that's a very yeah. privileged perspective to have um, yeah. that's definitely coming from a place, place of privilege definitely like to to think that privacy is more important than um than not having food on the table yeah or yeah in, in yeah. this context I, maybe yeah oh sorry oh no 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 go ahead sorry. oh i was just going to say that um you know maybe the idea of a famine in 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 europe in 2021 seems ridiculous you know maybe a toilet paper shortage is more likely but um you know when you think about it in the context of um, I think at that point, the, there was this discussion of the NHS having a contract with Google or something. Um, you know, if, if your parents are, or you yourself are dying of cancer and handing over your data to Google could mean that they might find a better cure for you, then you might actually not care if Google knows that, you know, you had all these health issues and also here are my emails if if that means that you get to see your your grandkids grow up or something you know so mm -hmm. um yeah that's how um, it's yeah. sort of an absurd literal example of a first world problem right well, yeah like this is what people in western europe are worrying about is privacy and mm -hmm. people in china you know, like 900 million people have been pulled out of poverty Right. over the last few decades mm -hmm. like they're they're not worrying about privacy and mm -hmm. and that's and, and most importantly that's completely reasonable mm -hmm. right because i've read think pieces that will that will talk about that they'll say oh well here are you know chinese people tend not to care about privacy which is this, and even sentences that start like that right anytime you read a sentence that chinese people think that's I such know. a stupid way to phrase it right I mean, even the four of us in this Zoom conversation, what sentence could you come up with where these four people think? Right. But you'll read, you'll read think pieces that say like Chinese people are less concerned with matters of privacy because they've been, you know, worried about basic survival for so long. And, but they present it like it's a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. the Chinese people have been missing something. These sweet, innocent, naive Chinese people. Oh, you've, you've been really worried about food, but you've been missing the more dangerous threat. The more dangerous threat is hunger. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right now, I was just going to say because there's the, there is this rhetoric, right? Of like, well, they just need to like in a few, give them a few decades, and then they'll be they'll be at the point where they'll start worrying about uh, privacy, right? But that's right. that's another Western centric way of of seeing it. And and here, I don't know if we can just go on a little tangent and just talk for a minute about you know human rights and where they came about yeah, I, mean, I actually wanted to ask yeah because, you know there's because, obviously this you know where does this difference in in values and perception come from and mm. yeah the idea I was say, of like, human rights think, you know yeah and I think uh, China always gets branded as having like terrible human rights but um if we're using the U.S. as an example like the U.S. 
healthcare is not exactly a human right because you have to pay for it. So, um, in, and a lot of people don't have healthcare. So I guess that's, I don't know. But yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys thoughts are on human rights. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so it was, Ryan, it was you that basically explained to me how historically contingent, right, um, the sort of so-called universal declaration of human rights is. So maybe, Ryan, if you, if you want to yeah. tell us a little bit about that so that then, you know, we see how, why, why should China just adhere to them? Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm not a specialist in like early modern intellectual history or anything, but yeah, you know, like the general gist is that human rights are, they're not like the Ten Commandments, right? It's not like early, you know, 1600s Brits and Americans went up a mountain and they found human rights floating around in the sky <laughs> from God and brought them back and told us like, this is what's real. Like human rights are these socially constructed ideas, right? And they were constructed mm -hmm. by specific people in specific times and specific places. And most importantly, for specific reasons. It's not like a bunch of intellectuals and government officials were sitting around one day and said, hey, just for shits and giggles, let's develop something called human rights, right? They had motives. And some of those motives are good, some are bad, some might be bad, but have good effects. But the point is they had motives. And so if you look at like the, the 1600s going into the 1700s, um, right, like the Magna Carta is from the 1600s, the uh, American the Declaration of Independence, 1700s, French Revolution, end of the 1700s. Um, you've got this discourse of people are individuals, people have this kind of free autonomy, right? They're separate from a crown. They um, have the right to govern themselves um, rather than be ruled by some divine sovereign. They have the right to vote, yada, yada, yada. But none of this was ever actually as universal as it makes it sound, right? We all know women couldn't, didn't have any of these powers. Uh, Non-whites didn't have any of these powers. And in fact, even poor whites didn't have any of these powers. For a very long time in America, uh, it wasn't just white men who could vote. It was only white landowning men who could vote. Um, and when you look at some of the greatest philosophers in this sort of human rights, this liberal human rights tradition, you can get people like John Locke, who basically mm. base human rights on property ownership. Um, private property ownership. And so that develops for a while. And then after World War I, and especially after World War II, right, they're trying to come up with some sort of order that's going to prevent the world from collapsing into madness again. And so one of the ways they do this is by coming up with this list of human rights. Well, this is stupid and absurd, but just as a thought experiment, imagine you're in the room at, you know, one of these early UN meetings or these early League of Nations meetings, you're in the room and it's a bunch of people from all over the place and say Senegal or China has an idea. Who's in charge of the meeting? Who are the people in the room that everyone is actually forced to listen to? It's not Senegal and China, it's the US and France and the UK, it's the people who control the IMF, the people who are controlling all of the um, reparations after the war and determining which countries get money to rebuild and which ones don't. It's the country that just dropped atomic bombs on Japan and terrified the rest of the world for it. It's, you know, and then for the rest of the century, up until the present day, that list or these ideas of human rights that were created in a very specific time and place now get applied to the rest of the world, whether the rest of the world consents to it or not. And mm -hmm. it can be, you know, entirely true that these things we've created called human rights are being violated in China or in wherever, in the US, certainly. Um, that could be true, but the point still remains that, you know, maybe China is violating a rule that China never agreed to play by. Mm -hmm. And as a, I know Alba wanted to get away from international relations, but as a purely like practical question of international relations, how do you justify opposing or putting sanctions on a country if they violate a rule that they never freely agreed to. Yeah. I mm -hmm. have no answer to that, but it's a huge question. Um, and so mm -hmm. you get, you know, in, in the U S just to wrap up, right? Like some of these famous human rights in the West, we always talk about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. right? All these issues in France right now over the, the anti-Muslim mm -hmm. legislation that's going on. People are upset because it impinges on your freedom of religion. Um, or the freedom to protest your government, the freedom to vote, things like that. But nobody ever talks about, I think Oriana mentioned it, the freedom to have health care, 
or the right to have health care, mm-hmm. right? the right to uh, have a job. In fact, after the, during the Great Depression, when FDR was the president in the U.S., he was trying to propose something called an economic bill of rights which would have been things like everyone has the right to a job, everyone has the right to health care, everybody has the right to a decent pension, uh, and he never got it. it. It never came to fruition. Mm-hmm. But from a Chinese point of view, it's very easy for China to look at the U.S. and say, you're criticizing us because we don't give our citizens free, you know, the right of speech, but we're criticizing you because you don't take care of your sick people. Mm-hmm. And which claim is more powerful? Right. I'm not, you know, saying one or the other, but they both seem to matter a great deal. And it's not clear that the West is in the morally superior position on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I remember um, when I, just a few years ago, I think uh, a lot of people were talking about, you know, the the problems in in Cuba and all of that, but a lot of time people would say, oh, but you know, Cuba has a hundred percent literacy rate. And um, so there's, I guess, a always a question of what you prioritize and, and where you're going to go right and, and, and wrong, I guess. Um, and, I think, and I think Cuba is known for having one of the best like healthcare systems in the world. Like yeah. the doctors are the best trained doctors like in the world. So again, it's another thing of who, who, who's the West pointing the finger at and the U S kind of, kind of demonizing Cuba in many ways for, for years now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and with real consequences, right? I mean, a Mm -hmm. a super recent example is that with all the COVID stuff, um, a bunch of Western European countries in the US and Australia all got together at, I forget what the group was, either the, some international tech group, some UN panel, something. And they all got together and voted uh, to prevent these big Western companies from making their vaccine patents public so that countries all over the world could use the COVID vaccines um, because these mostly American, but also European based businesses didn't want to lose money. And so Western Europe and the US have, you know, will probably never know the exact numbers of people who are going to die or suffer because of these sorts of decisions. Um, They all throughout the pandemic, the US has still imposed sanctions on Iran because Iran violates human rights, supposedly, um, and funds terrorism, supposedly. And if you really care about human rights, then shouldn't you care about the thousands of people in Iran who died because of these sanctions because they couldn't get the supplies they needed? Mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. and again, that's not to say that the Iranian government is is faultless or anything, but it's just very often all the fingers that the West and Western media point at other countries are pointing right back at them. And mm-hmm. that is definitely the case with surveillance and privacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, uh, just to be a little contrarian here, right? This is the way that um, countries have to sort of, I guess, yeah, point at each other and point out where they feel that other, you know, if, if you've got a sense of morality, kind of like Christians do with like trying to convert you to their own religion and stuff. This is essentially what countries are trying to do, right? And, you know, like uh, Ryan, you've said a couple of times that just because um, we're saying that the West is doing something wrong by pointing the finger or something, it doesn't mean that those countries aren't also doing something wrong, right? So, um, for example, the, the, the in, in China with the Uyghurs, um, mm-hmm. the in, in Iran and Cuba and all these countries where we are seeing um, what, human rights violations. Sorry. <laughs> um, but to use other terminology, I mean, these are things that I think to me as a Westerner are obviously wrong. And I do think that there is some kind of universal wrongness about these things. And I think probably the two of you, and I mean, Oriana, as philosophers, people who have studied philosophy can um, <laughs> tell me off for this. But I feel like, um, you know, in, in our guts, we probably do feel that there's some kind of sense of, of injustice and immorality in this. I see Alba smiling. <laughs> I feel like Alba, now. Wants, Alba wants, Alba to wants this one. <laughs> Go on, Alba. <laughs> no, well, it's, sorry, it's a bit of a half big thought, but I did predict this. Uh, <laughs> and and, and I, I, I particularly love the gut feeling thing because I was talking to myself this morning. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I was thinking about how the feeling of disgust, which seems to be kind of part, at least partially what you're referring to is maybe outrage, disgust, right? At some of, some of the things that you might see in other parts of the world. Um, and I, sorry, I have to like tell a few things to the audience. Like this is kind of ironic coming from me because I do philosophy of emotions and normally I defend your emotions as telling you something about the world, right? And now I'm telling Amanda, hmm, should you trust your disgust and outrage, <laughs> right? But what I mean by that is that um, disgust, right, is, a, is, is particularly culturally specific, right? And let me explain that. So we're just four people. I mean, when I think about but, it in terms of food, it makes sense to me. Exactly, like, right, yeah. right. In terms of food, like we have here sort of, uh, you know, we, a lot of us come from different cultures, right? It just be just the four of us. And there's going to be things that Ryan thinks are delicious, right? And, and Oriana just thinks like, what an abomination. Why would you put that in your mouth? <laughs> yeah, I would expect that if I brought some, some haggis to, to Ryan, he might be like, ugh. <laughs> and me, <Hi>. ew. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm just foul. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you'd have to, you know, then you have to like, even though that, that feeling is really, you know, is there for a reason, it's telling you like, that's bad for you, don't eat it, right? Disgust is very much about thinking something's kind of contagious, right? You have to then take the next step, right? And say, well, like what is actually, you know, in, in some objective way disgusting about uh, haggis? Is there something that's gonna make me ill, right? No, mm -hmm. right? And so that's, that's a little bit like when, when in, in morality, we do it so often and it, it frustrates philosophers, right? Because they'll be like, why is, and I told myself not to tell this example. So I have to ask something else. Um, <laughs> tell the example, tell the Just example. Tell the example. Yeah, okay. 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 If you ask someone, is incest wrong? The reaction <laughs> you get from the, <laughs> <laughs> not awkward. Anyway. Uh, if you ask the average person, and there's uh, Jonathan Haidt, I think, is the person that did a lot of tests with this, right? Uh, the average person is like, oh, of course it's wrong. It's disgusting, you know? And then you're like, okay. I mean, and that's fine that maybe that's the first thing that tells you something. But it's like, but why? Well, because they can have children that are going to have difficult lives. Okay, well, how about if they are homosexual siblings? You know, they can't have children. Oh, no. Mm. You know, it's still disgusting. But why? Because it's disgusting. And it's like, but that's that's not a moral reason. I mean, <laughs> right? to be clear, I actually don't know that it should be. In fact. Well, let's not get into whether it's just okay, or not. Right. Oh, yeah. Coming from Spain, I think in Spain, it's actually, it's illegal. It's actually legal, not illegal. Um, oh, I think oh, it's one of the, Yeah, as long as you don't have children, you can have all the sex you want with your siblings. Well, <laughs> you can marry your siblings. Yeah, so that's a fun fact for the audience. Um, yeah, fun yeah, fact I, from the current. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> the curries are a lot about this right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. I am not disgusted. Amanda, you know, I'd be, I'd be, you know, uh, uh, lucky be flattered. I'd be, I'd be really lucky to have right. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but seriously, right? So, so that's 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 like all that I'm saying. That just because you know, whatever you think about what's happening uh, in Xinjiang, right? And you have this gut feeling, right? Like that doesn't mean anything because, and I mean, I. First of all, I think there's some misinformation, you know, but, um, you know, I, I don't know, but, um, but that just, you need to take it the next step and sort of try and, and, and really point out what is it that you're finding morally despicable about whatever is happening wherever, right? And I mean, I was going back to, I was thinking back to what Ryan was saying about how uh, the rhetoric of rights, you know, even was first born in in Europe and in America and in France. And I mean, it comes from a, it seems to come from a, a very specific view of the self too, mm. right? Uh, that is, and it's so funny because we don't even share the same view of the self in all of Europe. Okay, can you, yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate on that maybe a little? Uh, yeah. 
Well, because because Ryan was talking about, I I, I was I wanted to uh, remember the specific words, but you said like individual and freedom. Oh, like the the idea of the yeah the the free autonomous individual that comes right. up in in like a a liberal framework. Right. So that's to me, right? And and Ryan here and Oriana, whoever can disagree with me, that seems to mean like some sort of autonomic self, right? So you're like a sort of entity on your own, right? Not reliant upon others, right? Like the sort of smallest unit. Also that you have free will, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah, like those seems like the two most sort of significant aspects of that. Mm. And, and this is mainly right from what Ryan was saying, right? This mainly occurred in the UK right, among the elites, right, and then America, and then France, right, but I mean, even Amanda and I, write as half Spaniards, I wonder if we did, uh, you know, studies in Spain about what our conception of the self is, whether we would think that we are individual atomic selves, or whether we are relational selves, in, in the sense that you know, Amanda's Amanda because she is Alva's sister, Oriana's friend, you know, Ryan's acquaintance or whatever. And, you know, and, and that's, and Amanda's not Amanda without all those things, mm -hmm. right? And, and if we take that now back to China, right? I mean, people, I, and even one of the articles I read that was very nice, right? They also generalize about China. They're like, they're more collective, right? And that's actually, there's a great book that shows that that's not true across the spectrum of China. And there's actually a kind of uh, uh, south-north divide when it comes to conceptions of the self. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But this, uh, 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 bleh, no, no, wrong word. Not archaeologist, the person that's anthropologist, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's, uh, this anthropologist, right, traces this, these different ideas of the self to the methods of agriculture. So, and we can disagree, you know, I'm sure there's disagreements with this particular person, but I'm just trying to say, right, that, that you can already see how one size does not fit all because, so the South of China, according to this particular person, uh, has a relational self because their main source of food was rice. In order to cultivate rice, you need to do it with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right, and you all rely on on one another. Whereas, the north of China uh, produces wheat, potatoes, things that you know each individual family can kind of cultivate on their own. Right, and that that even leads to, you know, different conceptions of the self, and and then different cultures and different kind of political systems. And and I mean, in China, you have so generally, in Ryan, you can disagree with me here, right? But sort of. Taoism is more believed to be the product of south, southern China, right? And Confucianism more the north of China. Would you say that's true? Yeah, see, I mean, like I say, I... Oh. No, that's fine. That's fine. I, that, that's why I have, you know, like, that's why Ryan's wonderful. Um, um. You, you fin yeah, finish what you're saying. We can, that's anyway, a small thing, though. <laughs> right, but, but I mean, what I was going to say is that we would even have to have like a kind of spectrum, right, um, of ideas of mm -hmm. the self, and then, and then maybe create, uh, you know, a, a different declaration of human rights, right, that, that maybe fits these different spectrums better. Right, because simply because it just seems simply obvious that something at the extreme end of the you know spectrum of the sort of atomistic individualistic sort of self it's just not going to fit maybe with the one that mm. you know conceives of the self as as embedded right mm -hmm. uh in its society um so that i mean that was all that i was trying to say in that and and what it, the point i was trying to make by saying that potentially right there's there's a sort of you know south north north divide is that then we can see how they you know different slightly different cultures arose from having different conceptions of the self, even within one kind of large territory. That, that's mm -hmm. sort of the only point I was getting at with, you know, the sort of uh, South-North divide. Um, I think that's really, that's, that's 
super important. It also relates to the, the sort of, I mean, you mentioned this, but like the human rights idea, right? That like mm. the, the dominant sort of default way we all have of thinking about societies is it's a collection of individual people who have all agreed to cooperate for some greater social good. Right. 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 Which goes back to sort of the, that, I think it was the, the computer scientist you mentioned, Amanda, where he said, oh, well, we've all agreed that in order for societies to function, human life is not necessarily always the priority. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's this social, it's the social contract, right? This is, this yeah. is Locke, the same yeah. guy who thought that to be a, a full real person, he had to own private property. Um, mm -hmm. And we are as autonomous individuals and autonomous, right? Literally in Greek means uh, self law. Right. Auto nomos is law. So it's someone who gives a law to his or herself. Mm -hmm. self. Um, and you all agree to cooperate. So if that's your idea of what a self is or what an individual human is, mm -hmm. then your idea of what a society is, is going to be very different. Right. And so your ideas about what sorts of policies or something like surveillance and surveillance as a concept necessarily is involved with the relation of individuals to a larger society or the relation of individuals to a larger state, right? It's necessarily involved in all this. Your ideas about that might be totally different mm -hmm. because you have fundamentally different ideas about what makes a human individual a human individual. Mm -hmm. And it's, I have yet, I'm not an AI expert at all. I'm just kind of an interloper here, but I have yet to read an article in any magazine I have ever come across or that has been sent to me that talks about AI and surveillance that also gets into nitty gritty ideas of self in a comparative context. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could write it. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> could you be well, distracted? <laughs> yeah, well, I, even Ryan, like the problem is like, there's even something lacking at that basic level. Like I, I did some deep dive, right? To get ready for this conversation and there is just nothing comparative, even the, the you know, the article that I found that was sort of, you know, one that really truly tried to explain things by looking at the Chinese documents said, you know, we still need a deep analysis, a deep comparative analysis of this, because right now we just have sort of impressions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if I can just shift the conversation slightly, because um, mm -hmm. this was reminding me, you know, so, uh, of a conversation I had with Ryan about even the the difference in the idea of freedom, right? Because I would say, right, we've been talking about privacy, um, but but the other sort of big word that China is supposedly lacking, right, is freedom, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so Ryan, I was just wondering if, if you might remember the conversation we had about what freedom means, right, from the sort of Western point of view. Uh, and remember you mentioned, and I'll let you explain that, that sort of aspect like negative freedom Right. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone anyway, just going to pass. I on. remember all the conversations we have. All the they're all up here. <laughs> the tattooed on my soul. Um, yeah, I, and these are not my terms. These are people who are smarter than me have have suggested these terms. But um, we tend to in the West, and this is definitely true in America. This is hyper American, and I think maybe a lesser extent to say Western Europe, um, but still pretty much there. Um, we tend to think of freedom in what people will call like negative terms, negative freedom. It's the freedom from, the freedom from interference. There's nobody getting in your way. You can do a thing you want to do and no one's going to stop you. So you can say what you want to say and the government isn't going to come in and censor you, freedom of speech. You can worship how you want to worship. The government's not going to tell you to stop, right? It's this stereotypically American idea of like, I'm free. You're not my boss. Um, mm -hmm. It's also the sort of freedom you see in uh, uh, libertarian politics, right? This viewpoint that the best thing that the state can do is get out of the way and open up, say, the free market as free as can possibly be from any interference. Mm -hmm. um, but another way to conceive of freedom is of a positive freedom, which isn't the freedom from, but it's the freedom to do something, or it's the ability um, to make meaningful choices. So. A good example would be if you're in a jail cell and I open the cell and I say, hey, you are now free. You can leave the cell. You have negative freedom. And if you leave that jail cell and you walk into another jail cell and then you leave that one and walk into another one and another one and another, you have a negative freedom, but the freedom is meaningless. Or mm -hmm. if I hold a gun to your head and I say, take all your money out of the ATM. I mean, 
are you free? <laughs> sure, you could say no, but are you free in a really meaningful sense where you're able to choose the things that you want? Mm -hmm. Not entirely, right? And so one way of thinking about sort of a, a West versus China thing, um, which is still too overgeneralized, but one way to do it is to think about sort of negative and positive freedoms. In the US, we, in theory, are good about negative freedoms, and we're not, right? Different people have different amounts of negative freedom, depending on your gender or your race or your whatever. Um, but in theory, we're good about that. And China's, yeah, not so great. It's true that you can't publish anything you want to publish in China. That's true. Um, but you, uh, there are other ways in which they have more meaningful freedom. If you lose your job in China, you aren't going to get sick and die. You don't automatically lose your health care, right? Um, if you want to get a job in China, um, you can generally get a job. Like they have a, a very strong jobs program and they're not always going to be great jobs or anything like that, but still it's a step up from the U.S. or a lot of places in Western Europe. Um, and so at the end of the day, a, a, a more robust conception of freedom isn't just negative or positive, it's, it's both, right? You want the ability to, and this is even a Western term, but right, if you really wanna be autonomous, if you really wanna give your own rules and your own codes to live by, you need to be self-determining. You need no one to get in your way when you make a choice that will determine yourself, but you also need to be able to make self-determining choices. Um, and I don't think there's probably any country on earth where you, you, you can do all of that. Like this is sort of an ideal end point, I guess, but mm -hmm. um, it, it definitely plays into questions also, I would say, of surveillance, right? Like what counts as freedom? Surveillance to Americans, the idea of it, it, it I think makes a lot of people sort of itchy because it has this big brother connotation, right? There's someone watching you and there's that threat that someone's gonna get in the way of your freedom. They're going to impede your negative freedom. Um, whereas if in China, freedom is generally conceived in, in positive terms, the idea that someone's watching you might not necessarily be an immediate threat to your freedom. Right. Actually, I think this is probably a good segue to talk about uh, facial recognition software in China used alongside their point system. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, probably interesting because I... Just have one one comment that um, you know when Diane you were talking about how you know it's almost hard I guess to be unemployed in China that it's it's easy to get a job as if you lose one and you have a right to have a job and you have a right to, and I don't mean that I, basically I remember so coming from from Spain which was a, a fascist country up until the early seventies. One of the things that older people in Spain always say that are fascist uh, is that, well, under Franco, everybody had a job, right? And in fact, if you didn't have a job, you were probably going to be arrested and go to prison. Um, <laughs> so I think that's what the kind of like, um, I, I, to be clear, I think it's a good thing that uh, people in, in China are able to, to get jobs. But um, I can't help but but think about that, you know, this, and I think it was the same sort of thing in um, in Soviet Russia or like in the Soviet Union in general. That while yes, everybody had jobs, you had to have a job, and if you didn't, you you were going to get into trouble. And so, thinking about China having this, I I think there's a positive way to do it, which is yeah, maybe the way that it is done in China now. Maybe I, I don't know if this is how it works. That if you lose your job there's a lot of help from the government to help you find a new job. Um, but for me, it just immediately makes me think like you lose your job and you get one month and otherwise you're, you're going to prison and you're probably gonna do hard labor and, and, and die. And I think I wonder if a lot of other people in, in Europe or like the West might also think about that in, in those terms or if maybe I'm a little bit biased because I come from, from a country where, where this was the case, I, I don't know. Right. No, no. I, I mean, um, actually, I mean, I, I, they, they're not going to throw you in jail, Amanda, or, or take you to a labor camp, okay? <laughs> That's not going to happen. But you do raise an interesting concern. So can I just, for the audience, say a little bit about the facial recognition software that's, you know, and um, 
and everyone feel free to correct me in the point system, right? So right now, China's sort of in the hot seat, right? Because uh, they have, basically they're the world leaders in facial recognition software. And uh, it is now 2021, right? So by 2020, they wanted facial recognition used in every CCTV camera uh, in China. Uh, and for that to be tied to a point system, uh, a point system uh, that is basically used to try to deter people from petty crimes, right? And so, and it comes from a, you know, like it's sort of, uh, a Chinese philosophical history, right, where they had uh, legalism, right, where you had punishments and rewards, and that's kind of how society is well managed, right? So this point system, if you do a bad thing, you lose points, but if you do a good thing, you get rewarded, right? And you don't just get rewarded in that you get a badge, right, and you're like, good citizen, right? This is, this then helps you get into universities, get better jobs, get um, loans with less interest, right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Ryan will have something interesting to say, I think, about that in, in America. But anyway, so I guess potentially, and I don't know this right here, where, but I, I wonder if Amanda's slightly right in that there is some subtraction of points if you're unemployed for too long. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Uh, because, right, from everything that I've read, it's quite a, um, uh, they've thought of, you know, it's very comprehensive, right? So, so you lose points, right, if you cross the road and it was, and the light wasn't green or there wasn't a zebra crossing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but you gain points if you have a baby and you buy nappies, or that's that's the British word, right? What do you call it in America? Diapers. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Because because it suggests, you know, according to the government, that suggests responsibility. Right. And apparently, uh, if you buy alcohol too often, it suggests dependency. So you lose points. Mm. Right. Uh, yeah. And all of this is said to be transparent because you can just download an app. Right. And you'll see, you know, it's kind of like your credit score. You'll see your points and, you know, how good they are in comparison to other people, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know whether they're itemized, right? So that one question I have that I haven't found the answer for yet is whether you can, um, oh, what's the word? Like, let's say I got points subtracted because it said, I'll let you cross the road uh, when it was red. And I contest that. I don't know whether you have the possibility to contest things. Um, I could imagine that would be very overwhelming, right? In, in terms of, you know, yeah, the administration. Uh, but that's sort of kind, kind of like how the point system is supposed to work, right? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've actually read, I read a book on, um, on this about three years ago. Um, it, I've completely forgotten the name of the author. I think it was called like, um, Can We Trust Technology or something like that. But um the the book was coming from more of like the negative side of this point system like talking about how um you know like if you have uh if you, so not having certain points would mean you can't fly a plane it means you can even leave china right. um right. you can um go into like certain restaurants or hotels mm -hmm. or um yeah it's kind of like a social way of living like certain people won't want to interact with you or even marry your children if you haven't yep. got x amount of points or something mm -hmm. um but so yeah the the book i read was more but the author for um transparency was american so mm -hmm. it was coming from obviously like a more american um perspective of this and obviously like we've just spoken about that something like that in america would be seen as like oh my god infringing on my freedom <laughs> Right. Even though I guess there are many other point systems in America anyway for other certain, certain things. They're just... <laughs> in a way, less transparent, right? There's I was going to say... Like, like, which university did you go to? Which kindergarten did yeah. you go to? I think. I was actually going to yeah. say that was something I was going to talk about with the human rights, but I didn't want to go on too much tangent. But I was going to say that I feel like the UK, 
and I guess America, but coming from the UK, growing up in the UK, packages things um, in such a way that um, just like has kind of, and has packages things in a way that even people within the UK aren't even aware of their own history in terms of like um, their colonial history and the impact they've had in the world. So they are very quick now to point the finger at like China and other countries to be like oh, human rights violations, but really, you know, the Britain was violating those same human rights for hundreds and hundreds of years in Until all over the world. Until yeah, I mean, probably could still be argued to still be doing that. So I think- Oh, still, still. Exactly. Yeah. So I was gonna say, so actually, in many ways, like you were just saying, Amanda, that actually China, I think China is much more transparent about the things they can do. Like, yeah, we're having a point system. Yeah. This is what people in our society are going to adhere to and abide by. But do we not already have these point systems in Europe and in America anyway? But they're just packaged in different ways. Yeah, like much more implicit uh, and yeah. maybe harder to get past in a way, maybe. Because, yeah. Well, I, it, I, oh, I mean, I, no, go ahead, Alba. No, I, I was just going to say something really small, though, with, with the, you know, the transparency in how China packages. And one thing that really shook me when I lived there is that companies will have a propaganda division. <laughs> they call it a propaganda division. And there's there's no problem with that. Right. Whereas yeah. we would be. We, we know that advertising and all of that is propaganda. Public relations. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. We are. But, yeah. yeah, but but so you're right too in that in in a way it, it's 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 just so this is what we're doing and then in yeah so anyway that that's just the, it was an interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from you. Yeah. Maria. I mean, in in the U.S., I don't I don't know exactly how they work in Europe, but I mean in the U.S., credit scores, right? Credit mm -hmm. scores didn't exist until 1989. Like, I am I the oldest person here? Um. You might be, yeah. I was so that so that was two years after I was born, right? Like that was within my lifetime. It was like credit yeah. scores became a thing, yeah. and now credit scores are these entirely arcane. Like Amanda said, they're they're so much less transparent. You, it's not entirely clear that you know what your credit score is, and a lot of the time, to even check your credit score lowers your credit score because the yeah. assumption is, well, if you have to check it, you know it's not very good, yeah. or you have to pay to check your credit score. Yeah. And the credit score will do, you know, many of these same things. It'll prevent you from being able to lease a home. And if you don't have an address in the U.S., you can't apply for a job. Yeah, um, yeah. If your credit score is too low, you can't get a car. You often can't even get employment, even if you do have an address. I've applied to so many jobs on the academic job market the last few years. And even like at a university, like you're coming out of grad school, you're broke as hell. Um, yeah. You'd think that these universities would know that. But there's a little thing you have to check that says, I submit to a background check and a credit check. And there are a lot of schools where if your credit check is low enough or if your debts are high enough, they won't hire you. Wow. Um, and, you know, I, you could be comfortable or uncomfortable with China's system, I'm, I'm regardless of that. But at least with, with China's system purportedly, you know, if I do nice, responsible things like cross the street at the right time or like, buy groceries for my neighbor or something, I could at least try to improve my ability, my, my positive freedom, my ability to yeah. do things in yeah. society by being a good person. Yeah. Like you could try to be a good person in the US and your credit score doesn't give a fuck. Like, there's no <laughs> way it's gonna change because you got your neighbor's groceries. Or you said, well, I never jaywalk. I always cross the street properly. Who yeah. cares? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and Actually, in a just, way, it's, it's worth thinking about like the translation of like ethics into policy, right? Like, yeah. is there a way you could encourage normal individual people to behave ethically mm -hmm. and to make their ethical behavior socially beneficial to themselves? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's even a good idea or that it's possible. But that's one way to think about the social right. credit system that purportedly China's doing. And I just say purportedly yeah. because well, nobody actually knows exactly how it's going to work. Right. But um, there's, sorry, there's, there's just two things, right? One of them, right, is that, right, was, was the West is sort of democratic. China considers itself a meritocracy. So it also makes complete sense, right, from a Chinese standpoint to have these point systems because it's like, 
you know, let's say Amanda is, you know, just super rich, but has never, has always crossed the road wrong, right? <laughs> and buys alcohol every week, uh, <laughs> you know, and didn't try to study hard, you know, like the point system will show Amanda doesn't have enough merit. She has money, but she doesn't have merit. So why should she get to go to the best university or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the West, it's like, well, she has money. We don't care what she's actually like as a person. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, but then which the is an old yeah uh, you know, I, that's just an old system in china right they've had right. these civil service exam systems mm -hmm. um that got formalized under the sui dynasty look at the very end of the 500s ad um where you know to to get into government service you took a test and the test was it changed over the centuries. It was always a different test, but it would involve questions about poetry. It would involve questions about ethics and what kind of a person you were, your ability to do historical analysis, your ability to memorize books. Um, and it was this imperfect meritocracy. Um, that's how you became, you know, the prime minister of China to work with the emperor was you, you were worthy through your intellectual efforts and of course the whole system was always bureaucratized and some people had money to afford tutors and some people didn't and some people would pull strings and it's never a perfect system but yeah that idea of meritocracy goes way back in Chinese society mm -hmm. yeah exactly and then um I was just going to say then the the, the second point and, and I want to just have a little social experiment with all of you a thought experiment rather than social <laughs> um so the part of the reasoning for the point system right as i mentioned was to deal with petty crimes that you can't take someone to to court for right and and because this is something that china has been struggling with for a long time and i i even had problems with with the law there where it's it's not transparent it's kind of all over the place um and so they wanted they wanted a way to deal with yeah just people like maybe pickpocketing right doing spitting on the floor like you know but also dealing with issues of food security right because of course there's been issues in china with uh, baby food which now there's issues in america with baby food um but uh and for 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 you know when they've asked the Chinese public, you know, like, are you in favor of this? They're like, yes, please, someone deal with some of the chaos I have to deal with in Shanghai, where there's 26 million people. Right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's huge. It's huge, right? But I was thinking, you know, that when a lot of these media articles from the West criticize all of this, right? They're also, this goes back to something Oriana said at the beginning, right? to me goes back to a kind of privilege too because I found myself wondering and, and I want to know what all the three of you think you know with what's been going on in the UK with uh, sexual harassment in the street mm -hmm. if we had uh, a system like this CCTV cameras with facial recognition where if someone decides to cat call you touch your butt whatever right not only do they get points deducted but their face is going to be on screens all over the neighborhood <laughs> saying this person right is a pervert and does not respect women you know <laughs> like how because i was really thinking like how else are we going to solve this issue because we're just like oh you know just educate women more make them feistier now some people say just carry guns and start shooting men that you know harass you <laughs> <laughs> like you oh know because because <laughs> god forbid you try to educate men right uh, yeah uh, whereas whereas okay. shame shame is so powerful right if in turn you know if 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 we had this kind of system and and whenever someone actually harasses someone there's you know their face is everywhere yeah and i mean I I was going to say, I feel like Amanda said in an episode, didn't you? I, I literally remember you said something about Alexa phoning someone's mum to be like, yeah. harassed. So um, <laughs> for, I think uh, maybe Ryan doesn't know what I do for my PhD, but I... Oh, I know. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Alba and I talk about you all the time. <laughs> I forgot how famous I am. I don't know anything about your brother. He never comes up, but you come up all the time. <laughs> So basically, uh, for the audience, um, I 
I'm trying to find how to deal with people sexually harassing Alexa, um, essentially, which people do all the time. And um, well, why why this matters is a whole discussion about gut feelings and what is really morally right and wrong. Um, but um, one of the strategies that that I'm, I'm testing is actually Alexa threatening to call your mom. Um, okay. And it's kind of inspired by well, there's, you know, obviously the idea that you can always appeal to an authority and in a way mothers are the ultimate authority for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but also um, there was a trend, I think it started by um, a journalist on Twitter who was getting uh, sent all these dick pics and stuff. And so what she started doing was uh, finding the guy's mothers online and sending them the dick, oh, yeah. dick pics that, yeah. <laughs> about um, that, yeah. So, yeah, I think, uh, in fact, when when I did see people that got this this reaction of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell your mother, people freaked out. Like, that was, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm still running the experiment, so I have no definitive results, but that seems to be, like, the, the response that most, it makes people freak out, although it tends to maybe end the conversation, right? But even telling them, like, there's somebody else reading this conversation, not your mother, right? Like, just a scientist or a student or something. People don't really care about that as much as your mother and the people you you know, right? Um, right. So I was reading a lot about uh, the idea of face, right? So when you talk about saving face and, mm -hmm. yeah, this... That seems to be something that we really, really want to, to preserve mm -hmm. as humans. And maybe it's got to do with the, the sense of self that we have that's relational. Or... Yeah. Mm. And I do yeah. think shame's like, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I feel like this, what you said, Alba, about shame is like the ultimate thing. Because even when you think, um, just like with paedophiles and anyone who's put on the sex offenders list, like a lot of times the, 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 the picture of the person will be put in the papers. And it's like that kind of, shaming isn't it like this person has done you know a horrible yeah even being uh, put on the sex offenders list i guess it's... it's like a big shame yeah but like actually like when you think about it the i was thinking about that as well like with um everything that happened in london recently with that um mm -hmm. girl being like murdered by a police officer and then mm -hmm. that off the back of that everyone's talking about all the sexual assault that women face in the uk mm -hmm. and i was thinking for ages like we can't really there aren't really many ways to combat it yes men can educate themselves more and but I hate to be pessimistic here but I don't think men are going to suddenly get into groups and start calling because it does come from men calling out men because they don't respect women mm -hmm. enough to listen to a woman mm -hmm. so um yeah <laughs> actually having some kind of point system well something where it would like bing up and shame that person imagine it goes all over social media every time like this person like touched your bum whilst you're walking right. down the street yeah imagine it like pings all your friends or like tweets something out for you saying i just groped a woman on the subway yeah right. <laughs> but but this is what i was i mean well, think about that maybe oh sorry yeah brian oh no no go ahead finish no, i was just going to say that maybe that it, you know, uh, Oriana's point earlier about a kind of privilege made me think whether all these or a lot of these criticisms of the Chinese point system and CCTV cameras and facial recognition come from a privileged position, right, of someone who is not a part of an oppressed, vulnerable group. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think all of us here might have thought at some point in their life, you know, I wish someone had been there to see what was being done to me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so I, I just wonder whether, you know, like thinking of, of something like that, right, would, would make you more sympathetic to having, you know, uh, I mean, you already, Oriana and Amanda, you're in the UK, right? So you already have CCTV cameras everywhere, yeah. Yeah, you know? <laughs> so would you, would you mind having facial recognition software, you know, and like a sort of identifier and, and you know, if it promised to get rid of, you know, some of the things that happened to you in lieu of you being a woman? I mean, I think that's a really interesting question, right? The trade-off of, okay, I'm, I'm giving this up and also chancing the possibility that maybe I go around groping people, you don't know that, and then I'm gonna be 
put on on social media or you know on my way to the supermarket it's gonna be like something following me saying this person is a groper <laughs> i'm not to be clear but or, or yes. jaywalking let's use the example of jaywalking which i i, right. I am right and, and maybe i won't care maybe i'm like everybody and their mother jaywalks at some point so right. whatever right um but i think that's a very interesting thought experiment and i think i would I would actually maybe be willing to allow that in exchange for, you know, some some kind of the, the opposite side of freedom. So like uh, Ryan was talking about positive and negative freedoms, right? So instead of my, you know, their freedom to to grope people or to sexually harass people, because it should be something like catcalling or something that, um, you know, having instead the, sorry, I could just hear my brother shouting at Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my freedom to, to walk around and every woman's freedom to walk around mm-hmm. with at the very least a much, much reduced um, incidence of, of these sort of things, right? Uh, and especially I think it would probably work particularly well in the UK where there is just so much CCTV. Right. Um, yeah. I'm- because I think that the UK's response though was like they said they were just going to have undercover police officers in clubs and bars but then I was like okay but who's then going to stop the undercover police officer who murdered that girl from doing that so like and let's face it the police haven't had a great history but of being completely um amazing and transparent with yeah. many groups of people and I think that yeah so I guess then the question for me would be who is then like monitoring the facial recognition and actually well yeah because that's that was the the problem that I was going to pose it's more like a uh to like just this the system in general right is well first of all one of design right like who designs what is sexual harassment right that's a huge issue but also there's like uh you know getting a bit more philosophical this is a little bit like um trying to defend you know like Kant's categorical imperative right crossing the road is always wrong (laughs) uh but what if there's a baby in the middle of the road somehow a kitten whatever and you need to save it Mm -hmm. right now that's a small thing you might think well I'll lose five points but maybe 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 it gives you points for saving kittens right and you get 10 points for saving a kitten yeah right (laughs) so it's worth it um and and I was going to answer some and there's a problem right with sorry I'm I'm getting like uh, ahead of myself but then with the um, sexual harassing right this was something I mentioned to Ryan before part of the problem might be that you know the four of us are friends we're on a night out and I shout to Ryan something like whoa nice ass you know is the facial recognition software and point system going to recognize that Ryan and I are friends and I'm not a threat. Yeah, but I think, I mean, here I might be able to chip in a little bit from my perspective of somebody who works on actually right. detecting this, right? Like this is a, yeah. a paper that I'm working on right now is specifically on detecting uh, sexual harassment. And I mean, the I'm doing it on, on language and in fact on transcripts only, which is, is harder, right? There's something about the tone of voice that you're using um, that might affect uh, that for example and yeah knowing your yours and Ryan's relationship and it might be that it can check um, okay are you and Ryan friends on social media right right mm-hmm. or have you appeared together on camera many times and these are not like <laughs> computationally easy things but it might be able to access directly like this is something that's stored like top 20 people Alba hangs out with if Ryan is one of them then she might not be sexually harassing him Right. But she might still, right? right? I mean, uh, we all right, know that right, like, sexual harassment, sexual assault, a lot of it is people you know, right? Yeah. Um, but that is, you know, you bring up a really good point is that it's extremely difficult. And even, you know, with the, the data that I've collected right now, I've got experts. So these are people who have studied um, gender studies and they're all even from the same demographic group. So they're all like young women, who study at the University of Edinburgh is a very specific subgroup of, of people and you think they'd have very similar ideas of what is sexist, what is sexual harassment, and they don't. 
Right. Um, and so that, you know, that I think that speaks to just how difficult that is. And so you would need a really good safety plan. Like what happens if uh, the camera detects that you've sexually harassed Ryan, but it's wrong, right? Um, can you appeal that? Right. Can you appeal that within a, a reasonable time frame? I mean, maybe you can appeal it, but it's going to take five years. And then those five years, you've lost your house or something because of um, this flawed right. um, problem. And that happens with a lot of other things, not just um, this. So. Well, you know, it's funny because that sort of ruthlessness is like its biggest flaw, but I also wanted to answer Rihanna with regards to the undercover police. It's also like its biggest strength because part of the issue I have with relying on the police, even if they have their best intentions, I find that it's almost like the their sympathy, uh, you know, or ability to empathize more with the perpetrator always, mm -hmm. right, often gets in the way because they're like, oh, like, let's say I did, Ryan did feel sexually harassed by me, right? It, and, and then the police are like, ah, oh, but she's your friend. And she just sort of, she got out of hand. She drank a bit too much today. You know, you'll be fine. You know, just take a breather or whatever. And, and, and Ryan's like, like, no, why aren't you trusting me? And the AI would not have that issue. The AI would be like, I, I don't care that Alba was drunk. <sighs> yeah, this is objectively. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so it's, it's, it's a hard it's a hard balance, right? Um, yeah, I wonder if it could consider also input from the like victim. So maybe it could say, hey, oh. Ryan, I think you got sexually harassed by Alba. And then Ryan can make just a, an like assessment. A yeah. And yeah, it could be like- I wake that. up the next morning and there's a text on my phone. Yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah. scale of one to 10, how hard did she grab your junk? Yeah. Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, how much did you like it? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously like huge problems with that. I even imagine that, um, you know, if you maybe like you felt that something was off, but you're not quite willing to put a word in it, and then like your your phone is just like, so you were sexually assaulted last night. That sounds like you'd be like, right. oh my god, <laughs> you know, well, and like, but, yeah. yeah. But there are, we just have to then rely on the experts where they know how to ask that question that without potentially like, or, or with the least potential of re-traumatizing you. Right? Yeah. So that, that would mm. be sort of uh, the way, like, I don't know, I, I imagine something quite simple that says to Ryan, you know, uh, was there an incident last night? Yeah, there you might know, be even like, um, sort of indirect measures of that, like maybe if Ryan did feel harassed by you, then he might stop texting you as much. Um, and if yeah. we're in full surveillance or, you know, so it could like tentatively think that maybe this happened and then, <laughs> but this is yeah. way off the yeah. AI. <laughs> where yeah. This really is. yeah, I was going to say yeah. though, it's in, in China, since they're already kind of using facial recognition to like, um, kind of surveil like in this way mm -hmm. how many how many like instances are there are, are there of errors and how do they kind so, of go about rectifying that unfortunately like from I've tried to find it and it's there's not much information okay. uh, and that's also just part of the problem even when you try to watch documentaries the people that are allowed to speak with the uh, reporters are usually people that have been uh, vetted by the government or something like that. So it, it's a little bit hard to know. But mm -hmm. from the data, just in terms of how accurate the facial recognition itself is, it's extremely accurate because they've also, it all started with Alipay implementing it to use it to pay for things. So you, when you order your McDonald's, uh, you do it with your face. Wow. Um, so I think they were just able to get Minus it. Yeah. points, too many Big Macs this month. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think they were able to gather just so much data so quickly thanks to partnering up with businesses that were slowly implementing this. Hmm. Yeah. Which, to my mind, yeah. is always going to be the biggest problem with, like, mm -hmm. someone asked earlier, like, oh, yeah, can you trust tech or whatever? To, to my mind, the answer is no, but why should you, right? Like technology yeah. isn't, a, isn't a person, it, it's not trustworthy. Right. It, it's trustworthy in the sense like, is it gonna work or not? But, um, and it's always gonna be funneled through 
links to corporations. Like the U.S. doesn't get all this data and surveillance alone. It partners with Silicon Valley. And, yeah. that, you know, in that sense, the Chinese government is not necessarily all that different from the U.S. government, again, which is like the recurring theme that I've just been saying over and over, right? It's like they're, they're, they're all, they're not the same, but they're all just people and they're people in positions and structures of power. And mm -hmm. it might manifest differently. But, you know, as far as ethics go, to, to zoom out back to the, the sort of original point Alba made of like getting away from international relations and stuff, as far as ethics goes, one good point is that all these people who, who criticize or write about surveillance technology in China, um, I think there's a basic ethical question of should they? Mm -hmm. um, in the sense of, you know, should people be worried about like cleaning up their own house first before they go out and point fingers at other people? Maybe not. Maybe you say like a uh, government doing shady things anywhere is a problem and we should all be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but surely for the efficacy of your ethics, if you want people to pay attention to your ethics, you want to try to speak from a place without hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then you've got the problem. Of that is saying... not something that often happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I feel like if you, if you always say that you can only point things out if right. you, yeah, your own house is in order and you're perfect. Um, then I don't know, like, uh, you know, it's Easter Monday, if we can say that uh, whoever, what is, what is the saying about throwing stones? Oh, yeah. Let okay. he who is without sin cast the first stone. Yes, that's it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I, I, mm -hmm. So, yeah, does that mean we can never point it out? I don't know. I, but I just think, no. Yeah, I, and I, I don't. Mm -hmm. sorry. sorry, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say, I don't even think it's so much of an, an ethical thing. Like, it's not that you you can't do it but i think alba mentioned um at the beginning that like one thing that might come up is sort of post-colonial themes right and mm -hmm. so from the standpoint of like post-colonial work um there are a lot of post-colonial theorists and activists who make the case that um if you live in the empire especially in the heart of the empire so america right or it's it's allies like western europe and canada if you're in the empire your job to create a more just world is to dismantle the empire. Like, yeah. That's what needs to happen. Um, yeah. And it, it, that's not to say that China's doing things that are okay. It's just to say, you have a finite amount of energy and attention in the world. Why are you putting 70% of it into railing against China? And I'm not even saying I agree with that argument, but that is a very strong current in post-colonial thought out there is, mm -hmm. you know, your, your country, certainly Britain and the U.S., we've done a great deal of damage in the world and are responsible for a lot of the reason it is the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. And is the most effective thing we can do to help those, those poor, naive people in China who are being surveilled, the most effective thing we can do is to criticize their government. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know, sorry, uh, sorry Oriana. No, I was just going to say, it's a great uh, deterrent. Um, it's just a great, um, well, not deterrent, it's not the right word, but we're thinking of like reflective, like reflecting like the blame, like it's quite, it's much easier for, um, like I was saying before, just the UK doesn't like to look inwards, even like that they released an, a race report this week saying that they're not institutionally racist. So that's the whole thing in itself, but that's just the kind of like amnesia that the UK government and UK people in general love to have about it, the history and what kind of atrocities we've done for centuries and what what role we've really played in um you know doing the terrible things in Africa and Asia and um the kind of knock-on effects so it's much easier to look at China and maybe say that China's um doing terrible terrible things worldwide mm -hmm. Yeah. Alba, you were going to say something and then well, I'm, we're I'm working... coming short on our time. We might have to pick this up. All I wanted to say just because I'm like, I could go on a tangent, but I can say in a short because also a solution, right, that speaks to all of the things that you were saying is, is not to say, oh, I have to be perfect in order to say something. But instead of, you know, every time you want to criticize China, you just throw Tiananmen Square out there. And it doesn't even have anything to do with what you're saying, but it's just to put an image 
in your mind, mm -hmm. right? Maybe, you know, to, to start from a place of humility and without, you know, the sort of amnesia, right, that Oriana is speaking of, uh, you know, about uh, that the, I mean, as awful as Tiananmen Square was, like, it isn't unique to China. Like, the UK has done awful things, very comparable, America, like, pick, pick your country, yeah. right? And also in, the, in recent history, right? Um, and just maybe for another time, I'll leave just this, this sort of um, thought out there, you know, the, that uh, the UK and America particularly are horrified by the language that China uses with, you know, its policies on artificial intelligence that they want to be the world's leader, right? Mm -hmm. And and this comes right from the time of Mao. But there is a reason why China wants to be in this kind of race, right? And it goes back to um, oh my goodness! Now, of course, I have to forget the word, the opium wars, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. just think about what happened with the opium wars, you know, and and who's responsible for what happened to China from that moment onwards, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like. Uh, it doesn't, it does, it's not China just being some sort of Dr. Evil. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the, the, I guess, yeah, we had, we have that for the like, Russia and China, the, yeah, the Dr. Evil of, of the world. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to finish up here for today and we'll pick it up next time because Alba still has to tell us about the ancient Greek robots. We, um, we need to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Oh dear. Thank okay. you so much guys though. Yeah. Quite, honestly, this has been amazing. I've loved this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you really, so much. Really great no, to have thanks. you guys and yeah, we'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, we hope everybody in, that's, that's listening um, enjoy the podcast. If you mm -hmm. have any thoughts or comments, you can tweet at us at uh, Let's Chat Ethics. You can tweet at Alba at what's your Twitter handle, Alba? <laughs> Alba Curry. Alba Curry and <laughs> Ryan Hart. Um, and we'll actually we'll link both of them. I don't tweet. In the, <laughs> you don't tweet. Get with the oh times. My God. Okay. Well, yeah. then get on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll we'll find some way for you to contact Ryan if if you're interested. You can you, you can contact him through me if you like yeah <laughs> Contact my, my, sac my secretary alba yes, yes. <laughs> i'll i'll perform my gender role <laughs> it also sexually harasses me <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah no, thank you so much i had a lot of fun and thank you ryan uh, thank you it's been amazing yeah. thank you so much guys yep. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.